have you people. Good evening and welcome to the monthly work session of the Board of Education. I would like to call this meeting to order at 6.51 on today, April 5th. If we could all please stand for the pledge. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For those of you who are doing at home, we do apologize for the delay. We were in executive session discussing a personnel matter. Um, we are going to be going a little off schedule. We're going to start with Mr. Gregory for athletic enhancement presentation. Thank you so much for coming, Mr. Gregory. Thank you to the board. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. Okay, so we have our athletics presentation. And am I just clicking? Just use the arrow, arrow down. Arrow down. Space bar. Space bar. Click on this. Uh, <laughs> you need me to click, you know. <laughs> it's really. It should be the arrow. You know what? Because Get it on the monitor. Oh, because you. Monitor. Yeah, you yeah, didn't put it, it in. on the monitor. In play mode. Okay. I'm going to have this button too. Do you need the flashlight? Ah. What, what, what? Time is in the budget. Yeah, that's nice job. We were Jack. having some technology issues earlier today. Yeah, do you have that? Yep. Yeah, take mine out. Take mine out. <laughs> we'll have to stop. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll get mine back up. Cool. I think that means, I think. I didn't have we got to get it up and drag and keep it. Yeah, more. Yeah, presentation check stuff out. Yeah. Extension that was, and I couldn't get it written down because it was going too fast. That was my goal. You might want to just close mine and just hope that we okay. can open it back up. Well, minimize, minimize. Wait, was that saying? Pass. Oh, that's a problem. <laughs> Dialogue boxes. I want to repair my PowerPoint. While we're waiting, you can look over the agenda in minutes. So, save. Save time. time. <laughs> yeah. This, I'm just curious if that one's going to work. You want to close out of that one? Yeah. Well, now this is not even working. Frozen. Okay. Okay. I could just present this back. Yeah, why don't why don't yep. you go through it yep. and then I'll try to keep you trying to take out the yes, I did. Let me have you it want. again. I'll try it. I think I had to pick it up. Be prepared. Yeah. All right. So, are we ready? Or are you okay? All right. So, um, unfortunately, we don't have the display, but um, I do have the handouts. We can get the display um, at another time for everybody to view. Um, but first up, um, we did have a. I created a Rocks Athletic Advisory Community um, Committee, RAC. Um, that consisted of um, community members, student athletes, coaches, and teachers as well. Um, we wanted to see where we are with the state of athletics. So one of the first items that we decided to do was do a student survey. Um, we did issue the student survey for current 6th through 12th graders. So we had two separate surveys, one focusing on middle school students. So that would be the sixth and seventh, current 6th and 7th graders and then we would have the eighth through 12th graders. Now we allowed the 12th graders to do it just because they were in the physical education classes, but we did um, take out their answers when we were looking as we moved forward. Um, we did have a high response rate. I believe we had 78% at the, the sixth and seventh grade level and 83. Um, this was done, I believe if I remember right, 12, 15 and 16, um, uh, odd days, even days for the high school and at the elementary, we went 12, 14, 15, and 16. We did have a couple students um, a few days after that, but not, not too significant. But the bulk of the survey was done over those two days. Um, 
we move on to the next page, page two, we flip over. Um, just to give you an idea of our current roster numbers, um, I was able to get in what we have now for our spring season. So if you're looking at the first three columns, that is going to be the high school, and the last three columns is going to be the middle school or junior high school. Um, when you're looking at the numbers here, you'll see some sports have two numbers. So, for example, football, 33, that's varsity. And then we have slash 32 would be the JV. So that's what we had this year that actually were um, registered to play and were out on the field or on the court. Okay. So if you notice, we moved down a little bit. Uh, our boys soccer and girls soccer programs, that's the ones that are merged with Malvern. So we do have uh, lower numbers there, hence why we're actually merged with them. Um, cheerleading, you're going to notice that we actually have an A team and I have an X that's highlighted because we did have a JV team budgeted, but we did not have enough student athletes, nor could we find a coach. So rather than have two small teams, we combined it to have one robust team at the varsity level. And that's what we're going to do moving forward because we want to make sure that we do have enough student athletes at the varsity games. Um, volleyball, we're very healthy with. Cross country, we had good numbers. That's combined both boys and girls. Um, when we had 47% of our student population at the high school level that were actually participating in fall sports. Um, you'll see a drastic reduction in the winter. We're down to 25%. Um, and that's something you'll see where we address in our um, advisory committee. Um, so our basketball numbers are pretty much uh, strong. The pleasant surprise was our boys and girls winter track team. That was something that I did go to the superintendent and Ms. Creo to try to get that fielded since we did not field the JV team. So we didn't just fold the JV cheerleading team. We actually rolled it into another team to provide more opportunities. So we took a survey and we actually had 12 students that we knew that were definitely going to go out. So we, we did the recruiting and lo and behold, at one point we had 40 student athletes going out for the winter track team. And I'm sure as most of you do know, as parents, winter season, we tend to have a little bit of attrition. So we did have a healthy 36 by the end of the season. So we did start with one coach um, and you'll see we kind of address that uh, later on in there. But that was a big boon. Um, one of the great things about that is we were actually able to start using the track outside for our training. So that was uh, they, the, the track team was breaking out the field prior to the uh, spring season. Um, wrestling, and you'll notice that there's only two student athletes there. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, that is a combined team with uh, Rockville Center, which is Southside High School. The spring season kind of reflects what we had in our fall. We had 46% of our student athletes. We actually had a few more, but a couple dropped out here and there. So we started out for 47%, we're down to 46%. Um, again, our boys lacrosse and girls lacrosse, the numbers here are a little bit lower, but again, those are our merged teams with Malvern. Um, although we have boys tennis merged with Malvern, we did not actually field any of our student athletes um, with them. Um, our track team, again, we have 36. Uh, badminton, this is a big surprise. So that's something, again, I wasn't here last year, so I didn't have um, any of the numbers to go by. But this is a, a very surprising number. Yes, right there. Um, that's a very surprising number. Um, so that's something in the future um, we can actually discuss about possibly going for a JV team with our badminton numbers. Um, the next set of uh, columns you'll see is we have our middle school or junior high school. Um, again, we're still healthy with uh, football, um, girls soccer. We field on our own at the middle school, so we had healthy numbers there. Our cheer, again, is five. So you're kind of seeing what I was talking about with the JV team. Um, cheerleading is, is start to start to moving on a down climb right now, and I'll get into that a little bit. But um, our boys and girls cross country, again, that's combined. So we offer everything in the fall that we possibly could at the middle school. We have 36% of our um, student at our uh, middle school population going out for that. I think we can increase these numbers next year um, since I'm here now. One of the plans that we're going to have is to try to address that for our incoming student athletes. Uh, so this way, our incoming students, to get them to become student athletes um, once they come to the high school um, during those days. So we could target both the Ram Avenue and the Center Avenue students. 
So the winter is where I'd really like for you to focus on. Um, we do offer only three teams. Now, for those that don't know, the winter season for modified sports or junior high school sports um, consists of two seasons. They call it winter one and winter two. In winter one, we only offer one opportunity for boys, one opportunity for girls. So that would be boys basketball and girls volleyball. Okay. We do have a healthy number of student athletes trying out, but there's only limited roster spots. Similarly, we have girls basketball is the only real team that we offer during winter two. So we have one option for girls. We don't have one for boys. Um, we did have competitive cheer budgeted for this year. Unfortunately, we didn't have the numbers. So that's why that's highlighted there. So again, this is where I approached the superintendent and Ms. Greel about providing more opportunities for our student athletes. So what we did was we focused on winter two and we targeted volleyball for boys. And we decided let's give the girls that didn't make the basketball team for this year, give them an opportunity to practice. So this way they can possibly make the team next year. Um, as you can see through here, um, we had in winter one, we had 40 student athletes, winter two, we only had 18. But if you look at the intramural numbers, that bumped up drastically to 37 students that were participating both in the boys bas oh, sorry, boys volleyball and the girls basketball intramurals. So if you look, we only had 20% winter one of student athletes. So that's a you know pretty big drop, um, again, because we don't have the offering. We only had 11% of our student athletes participating. But if you, if you include our intramurals, we bumped that up to 28%. So we actually beat what we had in uh, winter one. So that's that's where you're gonna see where we really focused on with our committee. Um, we're in the spring season now. Um, we have not played any games, but we do have robust, robust numbers there as well. Um, our, our, we have about 46% in our spring. Are there any questions about our current status for our student athletes? No. All right, great. So I'm gonna get into the survey. So I'm still on the, on the second page here on the bottom. So focusing on the middle school, um, what we have on the left-hand side is what we offer, okay? And this is what we got from the survey. So again, football, soccer, uh, healthy numbers. Those were our big numbers too when we had actual participation. So on our right-hand side, this is what we do not offer um, and we really don't have that interest. Why I have boys soccer highlighted is because this was something that was brought to my attention that we were looking at possibly offering boys soccer but we really did not have that interest. So at this point, I can't see us offering that program because we just don't have those numbers. Can that change? Absolutely, especially now that we have the field, um, we can start offering different types of programs. And one of the things is we talked about a possible intramural with boys soccer. Okay, next slide. All right, so moving on, um, this is where we're at with our winter. Once again, we have winter one and winter two. So again, the numbers, is it okay if I say? So the numbers do reflect what we've seen um, when we had our registration process. We have a large number of these are the most popular sports. Okay, the same thing in girls. But again, we don't have anything for them to go to if they're cut. And that's where we wanted to focus on because we, we saw if we gave them options, they'll come out and they'll play. Okay, so winter track, competitive cheer. Again, competitive cheer, we'll get against that. We still don't have those numbers yet, but track is a big option. We do have a lot of these students here that they're, because we gave them what would be their first option on the survey. And if your first option wasn't available, what would be your second option? So the majority of these students, their second option was winter track. So that's where I feel we can actually get that winter track going. And again, that's going to help become a feeder program for our brand new winter track program that we have at the varsity level. Uh, winter two, what was very nice is we saw a large interest in bowling. Um, again, winter track and bowling, these sports are more lifetime sports. So we're actually, we're targeting a different population of students, which is great. So they may not want to be in that contact sport. So we want to try to give them those opportunities. Um, boys volleyball, again, the number nine is low. But again, after we had those intramurals, we definitely will see those numbers increase. So um, boys volleyball was a lot, a uh, second option for a lot of our students. You go to the next slide. 
Um, in our high school survey, we're still strong in our top two programs, which is football and girls volleyball, which we do see a lot going out for. Sideline chair is 28. Again, these are all numbers that say they're going to go out for the team. In reality, they're not all going to, okay, as, as we have this survey. However, this does reflect what we see as we typically get these two sports. We do get in our district the highest number of students that register for them. Um, again, as you can see, boys soccer is down low at 21, okay, um, and girls tennis. That's another team that we know from Malibar, okay. Something, again, at the high school level, boys volleyball. So we did have a lot, and there's a few that would have that as a secondary option. But the nice thing about boys volleyball, out of the 11 students that were there, only one conflicted with football and only one conflicted with JV soccer. So that is something that we may want to look at, because if we do end up going to a middle school boys volleyball program, eventually we may be able to offer that at the high school level. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, again, you'll see wrestling is highlighted for a reason. But again, our two bigger sports are the boys and girls basketball. Winter track is very popular now that we have the track. Competitive cheer, we did not have enough to field. It is still budgeted for next year because we still want to push that program. And we're going to try to get that going. Um, and I'll talk about uh, some of the logistics with that. Again, boys, boys and girls bowling. We had a lot of numbers. And a lot of the secondary was... Secondary choices was boys and girls bowling. Wrestling, six student athletes, or six students that put in for it. Interviewed all six. Five of them said, no, they weren't going to do it. Okay, one of them said he was interested, but he would have to work two to three days a week. So he would not be able to make that uh, a commitment to be on the wrestling team. So right now, that six is really a zero. Okay, so I did, I did interview those students. Next slide. So this is what I was discussing before. Our cheerleading seems to be on the decline, which again, is not a bad thing. Um, in a small district like this, we have to look at the ebb and flow. There's gonna be years where we have different interests. I know at one point we did have bowling and then that ended up going away. So that's why it's important to keep doing these surveys every couple of years to keep up with the interest right now. So again, the sideline cheer is popular because of the football, but the competitiveness seems not to be there yet. Um, if we get the right person into the program and we can build it, that might be something that we can do moving forward. But again, we took out the JV team. Okay, it saves on a coaching stipend that we could put elsewhere. So we're not just getting, we're not just eliminating that. We're going to be replacing that somewhere else. We save on the transportation costs as well because we just have the one team. And then as I was talking about with the cheer, the big aspect with the competitive cheer is um facility space it's very difficult um since we don't have a lot of space is trying to get those practices we try to get them early as possible but again the mats are very large they need to be stored it's not like we can go to rain one day um of the week and practice or two days a week and then here because we have to move those mats so we do need a facility that's also tall enough for our student athletes to make those stunts and tosses um, we do have a about, I think it's about four to six freshman girls that are very, very interested in this. I did look at other schools to try to look at a possible merger, but a lot of them are making cuts. So they're not going to be willing to take us in. Um, so my hope is that we try to build from within to uh, keep this going. So it still is budgeted. But again, the other thing that we have is we don't have that feeder program, that middle school um, competitive cheer team. Okay, next slide. So wrestling. So this is another thing. So wrestling and competitive cheer are kind of in the same aspect. They need the space. They need the mats, something that we don't have. Wrestling, um, wrestling and football are the combat sports. Those are the ones where it takes a person, hey, they get hit. What am I going to do back? So a lot of people are not used to that. A lot of times with wrestling, you really want to have that coach in-house to do that recruiting, and that's how you build that feeder program. That's where you'll get the junior high school, and then a lot of times you'll have the varsity student athletes working with them during their season. We just don't have that right now. Um, I did go speak, to, uh, I didn't physically go, but I did speak to the Lindbrook uh, Wrestling Club. Um, we have youth kids in there right now, so there's nothing on the horizon coming up. Um, and that's going to be something that we address moving forward. 
Um, if we can't get these numbers, it's not as if we can say, no, we're never going to get the, the sport back, but maybe it's time to put it on the shelf for now based on the current interest. And then moving forward, if we get that interest again, we can look at it. Because as you saw some of the other numbers, um, we did have numbers in other sports, so we should be addressing them as well. So from what I found out in the few years that we've had wrestling, our highest total number of students was six. We went down to three. We went back up to four. We went back down to three. Last year we had two. This year we have two. Next year we have one. Okay. Um, well, we also weren't able to provide busing this year. So we had to work out with one of the student athletes we had to make sure that we had um, their parents drive them and so forth. So next slide. All right. So some of the ideas, um, again, we reached out to the club. Um, it really wasn't something that in the short term that's going to benefit us. One of the things that um, the AD at Rock Hill Center, Southside High School and I talked about is possibly having one of our football coaches, we give them some type of either a stipend or um, we can give them supervisions to try to be that recruiter. But again, is that if we don't have the interest, is it really worth putting into it right this second or try to sustain it and build it? So that's something we have to look at. Um, again, we don't have that feeder program as well. So we don't have a, we don't have any feeder program where we're combined with another school. So it's just basically you get to the high school, it's varsity or nothing. So some of the things to consider is um, the transportation again. Southside High School, they do get out earlier than us. So by the time we get there, we are late a lot of the times. There has been times where our bus has to take them to the, the match as well. Um, Again, we don't have the facilities. We don't have um, storage space. Um, another big thing was, again, this was prior to me being here. The agreement was it was going to be um, how the pay scale would be, would be um, rated per student athlete that we have. Okay, From that point, they wanted to go to HAS because we were supposed to build a program with them. And at this point, we're looking at approximately $20,000, $21,000 um, to do that. Okay, I can go. Um, so some of the recommendations, uh, as we talked about, um, we were looking at moving towards getting another coach for our winter track team. That's got to be priority number one. Uh, thank you. Um, we looked at um, an assistant coach because we felt that at this point, it's still a new team. Maybe it's a little bit cheaper that we go that route with this with the stipend and we get the assistant coach. Um, Typically, the reason why we're also saying that, too, is they do practice together. They do go to the meet together. Um, so we felt that at the least, let's get the assistant coach. Would we like to get a head coach? Sure. But we want at least an assistant coach. We do feel the numbers warrant that. We do feel it's a safety issue. Um, the amount of different events that are occurring for one coach to, um, you know, to be responsible for to handle it's, it's a little bit too much. So safety is, is a big factor with that. Um, again, um, we are going to be using our track outside. Uh, if it's increment mother, we'll be inside. But again, everything is at St. Anthony's. Again, that's another big facility. So to have um, another coach there would be um, our highest priority. Two, um, our second thing that we're looking for is to continue to build on that program. Since we've had success with it, since we had the track, we want to go with the junior high school winter track team. Um, again, that would be um, a head coach. Um, the uniforms, we'd be using the same exact uniforms that they use for cross country and our um, spring track. Um, they would be practicing outside. Their meets are outside, except for the last meet of the school year. Um, boys go to St. Anthony's once and girls go to St. Anthony's once. So um, transportation, we'd be able to handle in-house as well. Um, again, and that that builds that feeder program. So we have the junior high school for cross country. We have the junior high school for spring track. We need to have that for winter track. And again, we're targeting um, a different section, different population of student athletes. Um, and this is where um, I think we, as a group, I think we really hit a home run with this one because rather than flood 
our uh, budget with a whole bunch of new teams. Let's go slow. We had success with the intramurals. Let's build upon intramurals. Once we have more success with the intramurals, then let's build a team. So what we're looking for is um, to do again in winter two, because remember winter two, we only have one opportunity and that's for girls. So the first opportunity we want for boys is to do intramural boys volleyball. So this way, boys and girls both have one option. And we would like to also have boys and girls bowling as an intramurals. So this way now the kids said if they don't make one of those programs, they have a second option. So this way we're on par. In winter one, they would both have um, two options. In winter one, they would both have two options in winter two. Um, I felt that this was a great idea from the entire committee moving forward. I think it's very reasonable and I do think it's very budget friendly as well. So long range, some of the things we were talking about, and I didn't add the badminton on here because those numbers just came out recently, but uh, the positive coaching alliance, that's something that um, I really believe in. Um, it's something that I think also works well with our culture committee. So I think we can build that up as well that we have in a district. And with the Positive Coaching Alliance, it affects not just the coaches, not just the student athletes, which are the two primary things, but we also reach the parents as well. So those are some of the things that we can do bringing in. So that's something I would like to bring in moving forward. So I'm already starting to bring that in when I have my coaches meeting, when I speak to the students. So already talking about uh, the, the um, double goal coach. So that's what we're looking for. We're trying to get them to get the student athletes to be the triple impact competitor, improve themselves, improve their, their teammates, and improve their sport as a whole. And one of the ways that I like to do that is, and I'm sure you've already seen that, is have connections to the community, have connections to the junior high school teams, have connections to elementary school students as well. So I think that's going to be a, a really big thing moving forward. Intramural boys soccer, I kind of touched on that before. Maybe that's a way to start getting interest. Maybe just do clinics, okay? Maybe we do stuff over the winter break, um, the spring break, things like that to try to draw interest and then maybe build to intramurals. And then, of course, I didn't add it on there because it was just pretty recent. Is We, we need to start looking at uh, a possible JV team for our girls' badminton if we're going to keep getting 40-plus strong coming out for the badminton team. So – and. I do have to give props to Coach Vito because we did sit and we did talk about it and he did have a plan. And I just told him, make sure that you explain it to the student athletes so they're aware of what their role is and what's happening. And I saw him do it firsthand and I, th I think the girls are having a great time. And it it's amazing. We have it's, it's a whole army. here. <laughs> so uh, I think so. This is uh, just a couple of um, uh, uh, courses that the Positive Coaching Alliance has. Um, I can always send you links to it. But again, the positive culture, okay, that's a big thing. And that's something that we have in this school district when we're talking about the culture committee. The triple impact competitor, that deals specifically with the student athlete so we can work with them. And then again, second goal parent, okay, instead of the parent yelling on the sideline, be positive, okay. So if the child struck out, okay, or if they fumbled, okay, you, you, they learn how to be able to speak to their child. And I think I have one more slide. Um, oh, so some updates. Um, again, I'm always looking to see how I can be fiscally responsible with our budget. So um, we did move to family ID for our registration. I've had, had nothing but rave reviews from uh, the coaches, the parents um, as well. It's so much easier. In addition to that, it's through BOCES. So on the back end, we do get BOCES aid. So that's something else that um, works very well. Uh, huddle. So with huddle, it's, it's, these are programs that our coaches use anyway. Um, now they're, they're attached to BOCES as well. But on top of that, huddle now has the huddle focus camera. And again, that's attached with BOCES. So with the entire package with that, we get that aidable through BOCES as well. So for a couple of years, we'll have two cameras. The thing that we're going to have is the huddle camera is going to be um, basically on our YouTube. Um, we'll have Dr. Fisk. I've already spoken to him about it. We've spoken to huddle. 
he's able to do it. So we already have our board meetings on, on uh, YouTube. We'll be able to have um, different channels. So we'll have the indoor camera and the outdoor camera as well. The nice thing about that is there is no subscription fee. We would take that subscription fee that's already budgeted and move it to the huddle in order to help cover those costs. And the great thing that we're able to do is working with um, Ms. Grio, we're able to slide money around. So at this point, there is zero cost to our teams. We used to have our teams pay a portion of this. And for me, I felt it's unfair. Why are, why are we making our teams pay? We want to make sure that they have everything that they need in order to be successful. So teams don't pay. BOCES aid at, on the end, it's a home run. We it's, do. It's still free for us at all. Yes. All community. Anyone who yes. wants to watch a game. Correct. They don't have to have yes. a subscription. We do need to keep the um, NFHS camera on. We do need to give them our games. They still need to broadcast them. But we are not going to pay for a subscription fee. If somebody wants to pay for a subscription fee, by all means, they can. But because of the contract we have, I don't remember if it's two years or three years off the top of my head. I'm, I apologize. But I know it's at least two to three years that we still need to leave it up. So we do have it up. We're getting ready to hook it up now because we just got power in the press box uh, last week. Um, so that'll happen. But um, that's pretty much what I have here. Um, that's it. If there's any questions, go ahead. It's exciting to see, first of all, how you collaborate with everybody to bring them all together to form this committee to get these recommendations and how you're looking at the cost effectiveness from intramurals all the way through. And also the biggest thing, which is putting students first. Thank you for all that. Yeah, absolutely. It's students are, students have to come first. I sit in an office now where I deal with the whole Nassau County, and you don't know how many drop teams that are all like dropping all over the place. And it's just fantastic that each rivalry is able to maintain what we have without dropping teams, you know, and looking forward now to building things for the future. And now's the time. So it's great, Gary. I really appreciate it. Among other things that because you just got into the district and you're still trying to find your feet on the ground is, and you're moving forward with things. So whatever the board can do, I, I feel whatever we can do as a board to promote these and, and move these programs forward. There's no questions about it. I, I think you're right, right on with everything you said tonight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great all in all, great job. Great job. Yeah. Yep. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you. I, I love the addition of all the extra intramurals for the kids, giving them more opportunities, especially at the younger level. is amazing. So thank you. No problem. Falling in bed and trending up these drop like yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm telling you. It's <laughs> great. And one thing I would like to you consider adding and, and that possibly is a service because I think you're going to see this and I know you know about it already is girls play football. This this came out this year before you mentioned they know and it was sponsored by the Jets and the Giants mm -hmm. and they paid the ways of the teams this year. Um, for the future, everybody has to pay their own way. But it's a huge response that's come out already. We have nine teams in Nassau County in this year. Um, Talking to Jersey, they started with 15 in there the second year. They had over 80 teams. It just, it just blew up, you know. So something to really keep in, you know, and it's a spring sport. It's not a sport that's in, you know, don't interfere with the football team. Mm -hmm. so something that maybe you should run that service. Absolutely. Community. So I didn't bring that up because um, I did speak with uh, Coach Pager. He is interested. Um, we were going to wait till things uh calm down a little bit after the, the, the grand opening um, and we're going to meet to try to discuss it and just try to take a, an interest survey um, of student athletes because again we want to see what would happen um, how would it affect certain teams um, again I wouldn't anticipate uh, the flag football pulling a lot from the badminton but I could be wrong um, just because of the nature of the two different sports but we do want to see because we want to make sure that again we wouldn't put um, a team in position where we would have to drop them um, for for that. Thank you. Really, I, I want to thank you. I know how hard you've worked mm -hmm. on this. The committee was wonderful. It was great to get the input from students and community members and parents. And I know how hard you worked to getting up to speed to encompass all of this and evaluate all our programs and get all the data and work closely with Mrs. Grio to yes. make these recommendations. So. Um, Yes, a lot, a lot of move, so a lot of moving. <laughs> the money. Yeah. You worked yeah. really hard. Thank right. you. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And again, if you have any questions, feel free. I'll be able to answer anything that anybody needs. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you so much. Did you take your flight? Yeah, I got the question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving on to the budget work session. You want to go right into that? Sure, we're ready. Okay, so tonight um, we're going to do the proposed budget or district initiatives, three part budget, revenue. I will go over the tax cap for the school district and I'm going to go over the estimated tax levy increase. Come in. You can come in. You can, you can join us. Hi, right, Jimmy. It's, it's hey, Jimmy. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a uh, adopted budget, so I'm saying estimated. It's the best I can do. Um, we're not going to be able to talk about what's in the in the budget this year, but at the budget hearing, we certainly will go through that in detail. Okay. So here is your 22-23 budget as it stands right now. Um, this is the final budget. Um, our increase this year is $869,077, which is a 2.08% budget to budget increase. What I have listed on here is the playgrounds offset by living with the Bay funding. So a couple of uh, presentations ago, I explained to you that we have the living with the Bay project run by GOSA. And that was um, the project that funded our bulkhead and reduced uh, the cost of the tax base by $1.7 million. In addition, they gave us, uh, they repaved our basketball court, repaved our back parking lot in the high school, and gave us a generator for the high school. In addition, for all the hard work, the extra time and effort that it took, just started in 2015 before I even started, but Superintendent Louise is here, um, all the efforts and the time that the district administration and Board of Education put into it, we were given a $230,000 reimbursement for time and effort, which is being received. Some of it's come in just in the recent month. The balance should be received by the end of this school year. And what I've done is I've earmarked that money not to be spent, to use to fund uh, a portion of our playgrounds that need to be replaced at the elementary buildings. We have seven playgrounds. Six of them are at or close to um, the end of their life. Um, you may recall when we did the federal stimulus funding, we put funding in there to redo all the surfacing um, on the playgrounds for health and safety. Um, we can't redo the surfacing without redoing the equipment. So it was really important to try to figure out how are we going to fund six new playgrounds, uh, which is a very expensive endeavor, without really uh, impacting our taxpayers. And this is part of how, we, how we're going about the process. So I just want to show you, if we did not have that $230,000 in that capital line, a budget to budget for our actual general operating is only going up by $639,000. So 1.53% increases, very low. Well. So in addition to just maintaining our current program, we also have um, addi additional initiatives that support our strategic plan. We have a uh, new health uh, curriculum at both the middle school and high school. We have new computers in the high school library which we know we need. Um, we have increased student opportunities. So um, the CTE programs are something that um, Superintendent Ruiz has been very um, in favor of, but between her, uh, Mr. Schaefer, and Mrs. Bonacorsi, we really worked very hard to make sure that we could expand that. And next year, we will have 23 students. Um, we have the ability to send 23 students. It's an additional four students from last year. So I, could just, I could just interrupt. I think this is something we've talked about for a long time as being a vision for the district is increasing it incrementally every year and then getting to the point where every single student who has an interest and wants to go and will benefit from the program is able to apply. So, you know, th this has been pushed up by need and interest and when evaluating how many students have applied, um, you know, Mrs. Greer was able to find additional funds in the budget, and I really do strongly recommend that the, the board and the administration continues to fund this program 
so that all, all students who would benefit and have an interest can attend this type of program. In, in addition to that, and I ask that to be put on the, yes, menu, uh, the, funding the agenda tonight, is the All Means All Career and Technical Training Program, which we'll, I guess we'll talk about yes. a little later on. Yeah. But yeah. as Dr. Dillon has really making it progressive, that every student in Nassau County should have to sell. And we did write letters to, I did send letters to the legislators um, for that, That's to support true. that. And if it doesn't get funded this year, hopefully that will stay on everyone's radar to continue because we certainly should benefit. And his rationale uh, is spot on. spot on. And it's how we felt here in, in our community for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And those 23 spots are all of the applicants we got this year. So we made sure well, we waited for every the single student. And we made sure we could find every student that was interested. So we all comprise so, that. And then there's the Nassau Community College Program um, that we hope to roll out. Um, that was discussed ooh, back in February. Mr. Dietz right. uh, gave a presentation on that. So that also is in here as an additional student opportunity. Um, we have an additional club. Now, Rocka Orchestra has been working, running as a volunteer basis. Um, always wondering if it's going to run or not because it was relying on a volunteer teacher, a teacher to do it voluntarily. So there has been uh, a request for several years to make that an official club, um, and we have this year. Um, and it, as you just heard, there's additional athletic programs and coaching staff. So we have a junior high school with the track, the assistant coach for the varsity with the track, and increased intramural program. All of this in that small increase of 1.53%. No, no cuts at all, just readjusting how we're spending things, looking at things, and making sure we can add um, more programs. So here this year, it took me almost six years, but we got to 75%. That's always been my goal. Anybody who's been listening to me for six years, it's always been, I think, programs should be 75% of our overall budget. That is the bulk of uh, instruction. And we have 11.79, which is administration, and 13.14 for capital. We'll go into that just a little bit more so people understand. As you can see, broken down here, these are last the current year's budget, what's budgeted for next year, and you can see the difference. $108,000 increase for administrative, $715,000 in program. That's where your increase should be. That's what we're here for. And then $44,000 in uh, capital. So what does the administrative component include? Because everybody thinks it's just administrators. It really is um, the business office. The very big piece of it is insurance, liability, flood insurance, cyber insurance. Um, we have an increase alone of 35000 Originally, it was 20000 two work sessions ago, but we actually added more money to pick up additional cyber insurance. Um, Auditing fees, legal fees, or district clerk fees, all of that is $108,000. So if I could just jump in, next year, it will. it's recommended this year that we include a cyber security piece in our district-wide uh, safety plan. It will be required next year. Uh, we expect that next year it will be required. So we, I know Mrs. Grio and, Ms., and Dr. Fisk had just gone through this mm -hmm. and evaluated what we have. So I think we're in really good shape. And when we do complete that part of the plan, because we will include it in our district safety plan this year, even though it's not required, but it will be in future years. So we expect it to. We like to be a little bit ahead. So it's always good. To we are ahead. prepared. And we're not doing a bad dash with all the other school districts. Um, this is the program component. This is the most important component. It's got uh, all of your instructional staff. It's got basically all of your instructional programs. $100,000 of that increase is transportation. Transportation has become harder and harder and harder. Transportation increases are based on your May CPI. It's not based on an average. It's your May CPI. CPI just seems to be getting higher and higher and higher. Um, so it, we're guessing what the CPI is in May. We have to adopt before that. Um, also, we have a lot of problems with driver shortages. We have, uh, we just finished the deadline for private and parochial schools was April 1st. We have three new schools that we have to transport. 
this, uh, this year. We didn't lose any schools, we gained three schools. And then again, we have the Nassau Community College program that we will be transporting. To. And what are charter schools? Yeah. One charter and two in Queens. Two Queens. Two Queens schools, yeah. So. And then there's the capital component, which is our security, our maintenance, our basically operations of the building, debt service, or debt services, as I said, we would not allow the debt service to skyrocket. We are kind of keeping it flat, following the 2019 bond borrowing, which I should be bar going out to bond in another two weeks. I'm working on that right now. Um, and then I believe it's two years we're actually going to see a drop in the debt, ser in the debt service line because we will get more state aid. As our projects complete, forty-four thousand dollars is very, very small amount of money. So we'll talk a little bit about the revenues. Is our tax levy, the state aid, and other revenues? So the eight million dollar number is based off the governor's proposal because the final state aid number has not been. Um, adopted yet. Um, I would love to see that go up even more, but I'm working off the governor's proposal. Um, that includes uh, foundation aid. We got promised last year that they would fund it over three years, and they seem to be holding true. This is our second year, and hopefully in the third year we'll be complete and we'll be back up to where we belong. Um, charges for services. We have uh, tuition to children that we bring from other school districts when there's room in our special ed programs. Um, pilots going up a little bit. I decreased the interest because we never quite hit that twenty-seven thousand, and I kept hoping that it would it would go up. It would go up. I know interest rates are going up. I don't think it's going to go up as much as it typically is. We're on usually about fifteen, sixty thousand dollars. I know it'll go up a little, um, but not tremendous. Miscellaneous is health services, um, drivers' education. I'm trying to think of what else is in health services. Drivers' education. Facility usage and E rate. Because when we do an E rate project, we do get money back the following year. This year we're doing a smaller E rate project, so I expect a smaller E rate rebate. And that's really where your difference is. Mm. This year I put $200,000 from reserves. It's a very small amount of money. Our budgets are getting tighter and tighter, as you can see over the several, last several years. Our budget, the budget increases have been smaller, um, and that's, um, that's been done on purpose. Um, our reserves has gone down from one and a half million dollars when I started down to two hundred thousand um, dollars. Significant decrease. Um, fund balance last year we had a lot of extra, so I increased it to one point one million dollars. This year it'll go back down to eight hundred thousand. And there's your living with the bay funding that's going to offset the extra two hundred thirty thousand dollars in expenditures for our playgrounds. Pretty exciting because we we really can get like four playgrounds done. This summer, we it's earned that great. money. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we earned the money, and the and the elementary students are going to get to, to benefit from it. So it's going to be a win win for all of us. And there's your tax levy, um, going up only three hundred seventy five thousand dollars for a forty one million dollar budget. Um, really, um, a very a very good number. I feel I think it's a good budget. Now this is the one that started all the trouble. In the Newsday, because Newsday reported that we were going up 3.99 percent, and so when we have to report it on March 1st, many school districts, including us, um, we're not ready to say what our tax levy increase is, because I know what the cap is, because there's a there's a calculation I have to do, but we're not ready to talk about the tax levy increase. And the last thing I want to say is it's going to be two percent, and then it comes in at two and a half. We really need to know more information. We need to finish. What are our initiatives going to be? And I really need to have more guidance. So I left it at 3.99 for the levy and the cap, which is what many of my colleagues did, and we all got killed, like we do every year. Um, but then we, we always write back to Hildebrand in Newsday and say, you know, you really, it's too early because we reported on March 1st. I revised on March 10th after the March 8th budget presentation, and he put an article out on March 24th. He had gone back two weeks after I changed it 
three weeks after we did the first one. There would have been a lot of changes had he gone and pulled and refreshed, refreshed his data, but chose not to. Because he knows we change it. That's, that's what we do. We don't ever want to have the community thinking it's going to be lower, and then we have to come back out here and say, oops, it's higher. Um, so that's what the levy cap is. As you can see, it's very unpredictable as to what we're going to get each year. The average since the levies, uh, the cap went into place over the past 11 years has been 2.11%. It's a little bit over there, 2%, but still close to 2%. And that has was the goal of the tax levy cap. It should just be 2%. And it would make life a lot easier. Um, but this is the most important part. And it's estimated because I don't have my state aid numbers. Um, but right now, the way it is, where our tax levy increase is 1.18, which is 2.81% less than the cap. You'll see our 10-year average tax levy increase is only 1.86, below the 2%, which is what the governor's um, help, hope was, was that we all bring it down and keep it down. It's our third year in the past four years that we've come in below the tax cap. Um, three in the last four years that you can see. I mean, 1% last year below, this year 2.81, uh, and I think it was about 0.2 below in the first year in the 2019 year. So we are fiscally responsible. We're in tune to the residents. Um, yet at the same time, we are still running, rolling out new initiatives and keeping terrific programs. And doing great things. I mean, or you just look out there. We're doing great things. We're improving our our facilities. We're giving more to our children. They'll have all the playgrounds. Um, and yet we are man we have managed to keep our levy increase at 1.84, less than two percent for the past 10 years. Uh, I think that's that only goes to show the commitment to the district and the community that we have. And that's it for now because I can't talk about the state budget, which will be in the budget hearing. So the budget hearing will be a little lengthier. Um, I'll talk about the state, um, what's in the state budget, what kind of changes. Hopefully there are some good changes that they're talking about. Finally, um, giving us aid on more than $30,000 salaries, which is ridiculous. That might help us with aid. Um, and, and there's just... There's some, some stuff that I'd like to see go through, um, and I think will. The legislative has, have, uh, they seem to support it, but no budget numbers yet. So, two weeks, we'll have more numbers, I hope. Do you have any questions? I do. Sorry, it's me. You know what I have. So, um, the final state aid number will be in before the budget vote. Oh, I hope so. So that if, if we get that two or three hundred thousand dollars additional state aid, does the tax levy drop? That's up to the Board of Education. Okay, so you guys know I've torn the budgets apart, and if you don't know, you can feel free to reach out to me. Um, I was really hoping for a zero tax levy this year because I think it can be done fairly easily. Jackie, you know, you do a fantastic job. So I would like to give out a chart to the uh, POE guys, and if anybody has any questions. Basically what it is, it's a couple of years of the budget that's voted on, the state aid, tax levy. And in the summer, a lot of times you guys get your final numbers, and they've always been more than the state aid we use in the budget to vote on. And then at the audits over the summer, you see the excess funds, which is always between two and a half and three and a half million. And then you also have unrestricted funds with that, like 1.5 million. So if just in my dreamland, we had a zero levy and I was wrong, there's three and a half million that's been left over consistently and one and a half, that's five million that if you had to dip into, which will never happen. Um, what would happen. So I spent a lot of time figuring out budgets and state aid. And so I also have a column with public and private school students. Our, before I heard about freedom schools, our public enrollment is actually dropping the percentage wise. And um, private school students cost the district a lot of money 
and I don't know if people realize that, but you lose foundation aid, which is huge, and then that affects all the other aids because the wealth ratio of the state is the wealth of the district, land, and salary divided by the number of kids. So when you lose kids to private school, you lose the amount of the dividing factor, so your aid drops a lot. So each private school kid costs about 10 grand to the district is what I figure. And um, so I'm just throwing that out there. And if anybody, I'm gonna leave these here, you can take them, not take them. And I'm available to share what I have learned over the last three years that I held back during COVID because everything was crazy. It's still crazy, but less crazy. So that's my spiel for today. And uh, there's a lot of districts hitting zero this year with all the foundation aid that's been pumped in. Only Jackie will have to I really think the right thing to do to the residents and the businesses, because the businesses get, they pay a huge amount of taxes. The hotel on the corner on Sunrise pays $400,000 a year. Little, that makes fun of everybody, that everybody makes fun of in the town, pays $200,000 a year. And one other thing, I, I'm a village of Lindbrook resident, so I'm near the dome where there's the toll building and then they knocked all those houses down, so I was worried what was happening there. So I went to the village hall meeting and it's like the village of Lindbrook, village of Rockville Center fighting over them and having a parking lot. And I was like, I don't want a parking lot. But then when I started looking at school budgets, that's East Rockway school taxes. So are we in the mix with them, with what happens to that land when they wanted to renovate that building? But now that building is saying for lease as a dormitory. So what are we going to get there? So oh, I said a lot more than I planned on, but uh, that's what I have to say. I just have a question for you. What yeah. districts will be at 0% of the tax levy? I haven't gone through all of them, but Long Beach, Valley Stream District number 30, Mineola, I believe Plain Edge is getting close. Oceanside people are being antagonized because they're close. And um, mostly, everybody's in the middle of it now, so um, I can... So it's an educated guess at this point. No, those are definite. The ones I just named are already published, report. Um, I'm not sure about Paul. Valley's tree number 30. So we can get to that. Long Beach is at zero. It's published. Because they were zero last year. They get... Is that the pre published or their file? It's from their live stream, so I believe it's fine. Yeah. But just so and you know... Several districts get more foundation aid than they're yeah, supposed yeah, yeah. to. Yeah. Lawrence, Manhasset, Long Beach, and Locust Valley. For some bizarre reason, Locust Valley gets a lot more money. But I know the aid in depth and all the formulas. So I've, everybody has to grieve. I want to have a grievance on. Because if we get the land value down, our wealth ratio drops <clears> and our aid increases. We're one of the few districts where our wealth ratio went up this year, and it's because of Marina Point. Um, we're above Lindbrook and way above Malvern. I think we should be closer to Malvern because I've, I've dissected the formulas and replot numbers in it to get everybody's land value down. Everybody agree. And it's a thousand dollars a kid in eight difference. So. Thank you very much. I'll leave those there. Thank you. And if anybody has any questions, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Doyle. Thank you so much for that presentation. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. All we are in technical training education. We have a dog. You have that. I did, yeah. You have the. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I thank you so much for sharing that. Obviously, um, it really is to support and promote uh, students who want to pursue a trade. Um, for many, many, many years, we were so focused on college ready, college readiness, and promoting our college going culture here, which is still important and it's still a goal of the district, but not at the expense of students who, for whom college is not the best option. There are many uh, children who are not interested in attending college, but 
we in the past were not necessarily preparing those students for you know to go out into the world and to be prepared for a career because it's really about career and career and college readiness so um this is a um promoting the idea that uh, we should be receiving some additional funding there's i guess proposals before uh, the Senate and the Assembly to increase funding for uh, career and technical opportunities for students. And so um, Dr. Dillon, uh, the uh, district superintendent for BOCES, they prepared a video. If you'd like me to bring the video up. Um, well, so can, that if, could we have a press, what I'm, what I'm hoping is if we could put a presence on our website with the video so, and, and keep track of the bill, how it's going, so that parents are informed that we're big believers and we need the community behind us when it comes out for vote, you know, and, and that's going to be you. So if we can put that video, I think, you know, it, it, it's a great thing. And we can put the link to really a letter. Um, I, I don't know when, the, I, I really don't recall when these, was it tied to the state budget or is I this think something? It, yeah, I think, I think it was separate. Something yeah. Additional. Okay. Yeah. So then there's I'm time. We can, so I'll look into that tomorrow, yeah. but we can certainly post a sample letter and urge our community to write write letters. Yeah, um, Dr. Schillen's video would be great. Senator Kaminsky and um, Assemblywoman Griffith and um, uh, Assemblywoman Miller to, but, you know, to support I mean, this. after what Jackie and you put together tonight, 23 students, you know, I mean, the community has got to realize how much they need to be behind it. What we're doing now, it could be suffering and far greater. It's a really powerful thing. Just the whole concept is really powerful yeah. because it, it is going back to children, yeah. students having choices in, in their lives and understanding that trades are really, really important for our community, for our society, um, and giving that choice. Because having a four-year college degree or a two-year college degree and then not really having motivation to apply that or to use it, I, I think the data is really interesting. I remember reading about 60% of people who get a college degree, a four-year college degree, do not wind up working in the field in, that they study. And right. so not that it's not important. A college degree is, is really a very high value. But for some students who wind up taking another path um, and college being so expensive, we want students to know what their options are and based on their interests. And so we've done a lot. Uh, Mrs. Bonacorsi has done a lot. She herself uh, has gone and taken students. We've been doing this the last several years now on a tour of tech and uh, really advertising mm -hmm. the opportunity that's there rather than keeping it a secret as it used to be uh, for only the parents that um, knew, knew that we had funds for that. So we go into the classrooms now and talk about the different programs this year. Uh, BOCES added a new program. It's a uh, an EMT program. Believe it or not, they didn't have one. Uh, we had a student very interested in police science in seventh grade, and um, this program was was added as a one year program this year. And the student will be a senior. And we really didn't have budget budgeted for that. And and just at that same time, there were two other students that really expressed an interest and a need. And so we were able to include them and the student hope we didn't receive back the acceptances, but we do hope he'll be accepted into the program. Next year, that will be a two year um, uh, program for juniors and seniors. But this year at the start of it, they're allowing um, students will benefit from just one year. And this is a student who's a very high performing student, takes AP classes. So it's not only for students who are not college bound, it's also for students who may be college bound and it gives them, uh, you know, a level of exposure to a particular career and then they might still go to college and wind up pursuing that. So uh, it's not only seen as an easier route because these programs are very challenging and it's hard for the kids who go to these programs because they, they have to carry a double schedule. Half a day they're working here on their required courses and half a day at BOCES. So they're living in two environments, two worlds with two caseloads of, of, or two workloads of homework. And, you know, they have been successful. We've, all of our students are, are for the most part successful in these programs. So we're very proud and we certainly will publicize that. That's great, thank you. And encourage families to, uh, to write to support this. That is great, thank you. And thank you for putting it on the agenda. You know, knowing that all of the possibilities that are out there and celebrating those possibilities is so important. 
for the kids. So I think that I think it's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, so um, the next item is the board dates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, vote, I'm vote. sorry. Yeah, the um, Bosey's vote. Um, yeah, we do. We did send something home about um, endorsing a candidate um, who is running again. I think the seats are uncontested, so we sent home information from B. A. Showen, who is looking for your support. Yes. So, um, if the board would like to include that um, on and support his candidacy, um, as well as uh, the BOCES budget. That's why we do have to have a special meeting this year on April 26th, because um, that I believe that vote was changed. So that's, we're having um, a meeting on April, uh, April 26th for that purpose. Perfect. So I believe um, you received some information on that and if you have any questions about BOCES budget and the candidates. Is that something that needs to go on this upcoming agenda or that's just a special vote on the 26th and we're good? Yeah, we have to do it um, in a, at a certain time when BOCES adopts their budget. Okay. So it has to be aligned with that. So that's why uh, we have to schedule the special meeting for um, April. 26. So these are on the proposed uh, Board of Education dates for next year. Thank you so much. Thank you. They are subject to change, but we always do, the board does adopt a calendar for um, next year at this time. Oh, I missed it. So uh, one item to discuss is um, we have sometimes uh, scheduled an August meeting. Um, the, the meeting in the fall is scheduled um, for August 30th. Sometimes if we have, um, and I won't know that yet, sometimes if we have a number of uh, positions open that we have not yet um, secured candidates for, we would have an earlier August um, meeting. We don't have to schedule it now, or we could tentatively schedule it and cancel it, or we can just schedule one when as needed, if needed. Usually August 30th will be too late to appoint um, because we it, it is so competitive now uh, with teachers and administrators, and um, we wouldn't want to wait uh, with the fear of losing a candidate to appoint someone by August 30th. So right now, I mean, our principals, especially here at the high school, we do have a number of positions open. Uh, they are already interviewing, holding demo lessons. So we expect to have candidates before the school year ends, which would eliminate the need for an August meeting. But that, that usually we've had to have one in the event that we had appointments to make. Other than that, there's really not a lot of business to discuss in the beginning of August, so it would only be for that purpose. So uh, sometimes we've put kind of a tentative date, just knowing what people's schedules are, but you don't have to do that. You can always wait and see what happens at the end of the year, and we can add a date in. So that's up to the board. I think last year we waited to see if we needed it, and we yeah, wind up needing one like that first. So, mm -hmm. but it's to be yeah. you can call a meeting yeah. anytime you like, and I think that would be fine. As I said, you know, the administrators are very organized. We won't really have any hiring, we don't think, at this point. At um, Rame Avenue, we may have um, one or one appointment uh, for a teacher who just uh, is relocating at, at Center Avenue, but we do have a few appointments up here. So if you want to take a look at those dates, um, we did not this year put the audit. Um, we put only two dates. on. Right. Yeah, There's two meetings. They did change and. We spent more time changing them than we did having them. Right. The the um, external audit is really required. It's timely. We have to get that in before mm -hmm. uh, the required date that we have to submit it to New York State. That's always in October. February uh, 
14. Isn't that a terrible day to have a board meeting? I think so. I'll get it to the boss. That's not yeah. Okay. It's a terrible yeah. meeting. And we can move that till after. You can move it to a different day that week. Or you can. I'll pay out. Not at this point. Not at this point. I guess. Good, good catch. Um, we can move it to the week after the February break, or you can just move it to a different night that week. Yeah. What is your yeah, preference? You guys want? You want the same week? Move it to the 16th. Yeah. Move it to Thursday or Wednesday. Whatever, good, yeah, whatever you want. Whatever night you want that week, that's good. Next then we'll night. Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. Just yeah. This way it's just. 15th. Yeah. 15. I can't do the 15th. <laughs> <laughs> Not your wife's birthday, I hope. No. Um, and we do have the date of the budget vote for BOCES, which is the um, it has to be done by the 21st of, of April. Mm -hmm. So um, it's actually the budget adoption has the 21st. The budget, right. the uh, BOCES vote is the 25th. So we're right. back to the same problem. Mm -hmm. See, see down on the bottom, the little note? Oh, she, they changed it. Budget adoption. To, okay. The budget adoption has to be. We just got to change. Right, right, yeah. right. We had no choice. So you're going to have probably have, a special have to have a special meeting. One item. Yeah, it's crazy. Right. Unless you want to push the meeting. No, you can't yeah. because you can't we have to budget. adopt the budget. By the 21st. So it's the same thing. Yeah. We're right back in the same situation. So you have to schedule a separate meeting. Mm -hmm. We can add that in. Do we just put it on now? Budget. Well, budget adoption. I mean, no, we need to do it. I don't know what the 25th is like. Is that a vacation week? I was just going to say, I don't know. I don't, I don't I'll look into that. Yeah, I'll, I'll look into that and, and include a suggested date. Other than that, yeah. Okay. Okay. The only thing is the reorganization meeting is late, and I'm not sure why. The calendar. So we could have it with a special board resolution. Yeah. The first July Tuesday is July fourth. Right. Right. Unless you, but you can do it on a Thursday if you want. You don't have to do that. We did that a couple of years ago. I think we did it was either on Tuesday, on Wednesday, or Thursday. This is a Thursday. July seventh is a Thursday. Yeah. So you can ch instead of keeping it as late because July eleventh is late. I don't know if that's going to wind up interfering with people's plans. So you can we can have the meeting. We've had that happen, and we've done it on a Thursday instead. So not the a lot of people come anyway in the summer. Right. So the sixth. July sixth. I'm gonna look it up. Because the fourth is Tuesday. Yeah. Yes, it's a Thursday. It's a Thursday. It's 2023. My God. It's no, it's not so Okay. It would be the sixth. July sixth. Yeah. July sixth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So we can make. I'll send a revised um, list home. Revised calendar home this Friday. Um, Add it, or we can wait until uh, May to adopt the dates. Unless you have any, no preference. Okay. Right, I'll send yeah, it home. We're good. All right. Well, we changed two dates. We're good. Yep. If you see any other changes, just let me know, and we can hold off. All right. Okay. Next up, we have the baseball. Yeah, so um, I know we've uh, discussed this informally. Um, I know there's been some concerns expressed by parents about um, the distance that uh, the bleachers are from the softball and baseball fields and um, concerned about their inability to uh, see their students play or be as close as they had been in the past. And so uh, we had been discussing if there were any possible options for that, so we really wanted to bring it to the board. I know, Mr. Volpis, you have a great deal of experience in that, so I'd really like to weigh in on, um, is that something, you know, mostly we're concerned about safety, 
um, the track doesn't really allow, as, as we know, we created a multi-use. I know. Multi, I know the noise is distracting. A multi-use field, which limits the um, the amount of space, and this was the original design of the field because it maximizes the field, but also provides um, does provide availability for spectators. So, uh, I know parents are interested in sitting closer to the field, but we really, uh, Mr. Gregory, we've discussed it being a safety concern of having people on the other side of the field. So we did want to bring it to the board just to make you aware that uh, of the concerns and then <laughs> we wanted to discuss it. I have my opinions. I didn't think that the view was bad at all. It's, you're, you're sitting in the outfield at a baseball game, which we've all sat in the outfield. At a, I mean, I know the softball field may be a little different, but I also was told that the batter's eye eventually is going to be up where the big screen you're going to be able to see right, with yes. the cameras. That being said, I also saw, and you know, we have to do better. Whoever it was, the community in general, there was garbage everywhere. So if we let people on our field, now you're on our turf, and there's going to be there's going to be garbage everywhere. Not that we can't, you know, put some garbage trash receptacles out, but I didn't think it was a bad view. I don't think we should. I also heard that if we put stuff on the track and they void the warranty, it fits, it fits the track. I don't think it's it's worth it's you know. The juice, the juice isn't worth the squeeze, as they say. Yeah. It was and very, very, we were very concerned when there was a scrimmage. Um, there were cigarette butts and gum. Right. That and was right. left on the field. And that was, you know, that's in, inexcusable. And, and honestly, we, we were out in the stands and a lot of parents were talking about it. And we, when we explained why we kept them back, there was, there was right, plans possibly of putting stands, but we were losing track at the point. We wouldn't have a full track. We were losing the batter's cage. And they were like, oh, well, that makes sense. And then when we explained about the camera, it's going to work. And. All this stuff. I mean, I also didn't think it was a bad seat. No. I saw every pitch I, of the I, games, I, and I thought they looked. I thought it was. I mean, I'll speak for myself. I didn't think it was a, an issue. No, no. I, I think we do need. And to I can't set reminders I can't. for people picking up their their trash and their garbage because we ended up picking up trash and garbage while we were at the game to assure that it wasn't. You know, it's just simple little signage right. or something like that would be a good idea to take pride in where you live and take care of the field. You know, it's a beautiful new facility. Work. And again, if you let people down on the field, what's going to go on down there? Like you said, cigarette butts and gum and everything else. And I think a lot of it is getting used to a new normal. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like people, it, the, what do you do when something changes? You're going to complain about it. But, you know, and I can see where the first game that I was at, it was definitely felt like it was far away from the softball field. But once you have the scoreboard working, you saw the pictures up, ultimately where we'll see the replays. Um, It'll be great with the jumbo trot Yeah, like I think that. that it's just a work in progress. As everything goes through. That's right. I think what Joe said, one of the things I think maybe the community needs to be educated, uh, because not many people attend our meetings when we were having a bond forum, and we spoke about this particularly, is that we were tasked with meeting the needs of the community for a track. That was, that was the community wanted a track. In doing so, that would have to now make our fields unidimensionally even worse than what we have because now you play a baseball game by itself, a softball game by itself because the track shrunk everything. In the track shrinking everything, we took this into account in the barn when we, when we had that jumbotron scoreboard put up there. It had, we know it had the video up there. We know we have the capabilities of showing the play, showing the batters and all of that. So we put kids first, we put the community first. Those were the two big things in this bond, knowing that all kids in our community we put first. So that is a part of sport, but we're providing an opportunity for a spectator in our place. We have the stands, it's a safe place. We, we cannot put them on the track. I have seen over my years, and I've, I've been around as you know, but a lot of years, tracks get torn up tremendously. <laughs> and that track, will be torn up if we put bleachers on it. It's the only possible sight line you could use is if you put them on the track. And it is not, we're not going to take taxpayers' money that we, you know, already afforded an opportunity and it's perfect the way it is. Is it ideal? No, it's not ideal. You know, it, in the eyes of a parent who wants to be right up close to their child. But I have to say, you know what, growth comes from one parent's get to observe children at play a lot of times and then can go home and speak about the game a little more than trying maybe it's a distraction during the course of the game, you know. So yeah. 
that all being said, I, you know, we did the best we can. I think it's uh, the best we can possibly feel here in this community. And speaking to people of what you all did this Saturday in a, a fantastic day, everybody has such pride, you know, rock pride that we call it in the back there and seeing this product that we have. So, you know, I, I, I do I'm not going to slight a parent to have a concern. That's for sure. The concerns are real. But I, I think if you know how we dealt with all the concerns, the things I just said, and what came up to us as these meetings kept unraveling, and what about this, and what about this? We made those decisions based upon the community, the, the, uh, the student athletes, all right, that were going to be out there, okay, and the parents by putting that huge scoreboard. Right. So we did take it to everybody to, in consideration. Yeah. I think the opportunity that the track provided, that was always a priority in designing Absolutely. the field. And you know that there was considerable time spent on fitting everything in and a lot of a lot of work went into that. And there were sacrifices that had to be made. Um, so we put the max in the smallest you know spot we could. I mean mm -hmm. we have everything back there. You couldn't answer anything. It's very right. I mean our I mean, VR <laughs> square the, the yeah. It's surrounded by well on it's small at least two sides. It's, it's yeah. surrounded by water. There's right. no more land. There's That's no it. more land. Right. Now, we kind of compared it to Valley Stream South, who yeah. had a very similar situation, and they had no choice but to put. I, I've I've gone to track meets at Valley Stream South, and they have their baseball field and softball field in the middle, and they had the same. They said the same thing that well, it's kind of far away to watch. But if we didn't do it that way, there'd be no track out there. And I honestly think our view is much better than Valley Street. Oh, exactly. I've watched baseball games better. there. Much it's better. much better. Much, much better. Much clearer. Much, much clearer view. So. I think if the Jumbotron was functioning day one, people probably wouldn't have said anything. Right. Yep. It would be a totally different game viewing experience for the parents in the community. Is there, just out of curiosity, is there uh, like an estimated time to get it? Fully the functioning, cameras? yeah. Get the cameras moving so that it is. I think they're all installed. I think they're working on the setup. Right, right. People have to setups. learn how to. Yeah, also and Gary's been actively and him and, and Chris Computer, right? I've been actively training on that. Right. No, I'm sure it's a time. You know, I'm sure yeah. it's a, uh, I think they'll they'll be up shortly. That's yeah. Right. I mean, that's great. It's. I mean, again, we only had I mean, we a couple were, of days before. We, we only had electricity yeah. uh, on the weekend before. The weekend before the yeah. opening. That was so, tight. Yeah. So the tight. power board was, we were lucky that they, they usually say it takes about a month to program, and they did it for us in three days. So mm -hmm. um, we you know, wanted it ready for the opening, and it's beautiful. The scoreboard is magnificent. It is. Yeah. Yeah. It's like yep. being at a pro event. The way it, so we said, yeah. we felt like we were at a real bad baseball yeah. It was great. And Mr. Howard, he's he's programming the graphics, so he did a great yeah. job. Okay, um, and then the last item is uh, days of celebration uh, to honor. I I termed it public servants. Mm -hmm. So I know that was uh, we had some interest uh, questions from the community, and um, uh, one of our trustees had asked that this be put on the. Agenda, so. Yeah, so it's there's been a number of at least two or three times that uh, parents, community members have reached out to do both there at the same time, and they were wondering. They some of them thought that we as a district did not want to celebrate. And we were trying to explain to them that that is not the case, and that we do support, and that we love the idea. And what we want to try and do is get something sooner than later where we can honor those. Uh, specific people. So for, you know, not to name every single one, but law enforcement, firefighters, EMTs, or first responders, or a military day, where the kids can come and wear blue or a certain color or, and really be able to show their support. And it really wouldn't obviously cost anything. It just would be a matter of implementing uh, the Public, support. Yeah. Public service day. Pick one you want to wear. You want to wear blue because police, yeah, right? So, a lot, so from what I've seen, a lot, of, a lot of other districts have a day where you wear blue or a day where you literally support well, a number of different ones, not just on one day, but it becomes a, a multi, like a month long thing where one day you're wearing to support law enforcement, one day you're wearing to support, you know, whatever other uh, public servants as you, as you put. So, I mean, I, I think it's a phenomenal idea. I know the community would certainly be behind it. Um, and I don't think it would be very difficult to implement right. like immediately. I like just pick some days. You know, we, uh, as you know, we bring in people all the time to board meetings, you know, and we bring in students, we bring in programs that we're doing. 
it's it's okay at a board meeting to represent, say, the men in blue one day. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And and that's it. You could do it at games. You know, we do the nine eleven celebration every year. It's celebrated at the games. Mm -hmm. So again, you pick certain months. You do one a month throughout the year, nurses' day and all of that stuff. I think that I would love to see us have a committee uh, of uh, you know one of our committees that we do at school here, and that the teachers take hold of this with students and really plan it out for next year so that we can incorporate this within the calendar. You know, and, and as our calendar gets posted, we post these days each month, and we have celebrations of those who serve give service to our communities throughout. We know it's one thing. It's, it's a no-brainer. We know one thing about East Rockway. It has a lot of service-oriented people mm -hmm. that live in this community. So we should celebrate their services um, because it will be celebrating really who? Our alumni. That's the, that's the bottom line. That's where you're, you're really, you know, you're servicing. You're, you're, you're saying these are people. And maybe even that becomes part of the alumni when they come back, you know, who, who does service. And we identify that. Certain time, you know, we have Ms. Bonacorsi brings us back for the online day. So, all good ideas. I love the idea, Dan. I think that, uh, you know, we should really look at that and the school should take the run with it and, you know, provide that opportunity for kids really to invest within themselves. You know, who we are. I love I, it. I, yeah, I, I think you have a it's culture, it's right? A, a, community, a culture committee, uh, Lisa, going on right now. Somebody told me the other day is it a culture going to, down to the elementary schools? And talking about uh, traditions, something like that. Somebody yeah. at Saturday came over and he said, Oh, this is a great idea. You know, I can't do these talks down the old ventures. And I said, Well, I haven't really heard about that. I love the idea. Yeah, yeah not, not exactly that, but okay. we do have a culture committee. There are faculty committees, there are different committees that yeah. the buildings have. But I guess you um, yeah. that's what I'm saying. That'd be great. You get a lot of people around here. Yeah. So you are interested in doing this for next year, or this? We should implement it as soon as possible. We say, if, if, if possible, I'd like to do it right. I think to do it right, I think it really has to be supported by a committee on the course. You don't want to slight anybody. You know what I mean? You really want to recognize everybody, and to jump on board of stuff right away. Sometimes you should change others. You know, so. I, my only recommendation was because we're coming to the end of the year, let's let a new committee birth itself and really take pride into something like this and fill the calendar. Maybe out. put out something to the community to see who would potentially get involved to help calendarize and things. Oh, yeah. Right. I mean, Absolutely. if you do, yeah. we'll get everybody just, like you said, you create goals. a week. Right. You think out loud. Like a spirit week could that we do. We also have when you would have um, community members coming to the elementary schools and meet with the kids. Yeah. You know, even incorporating that, you know, with people from was, different areas of service coming. And we and we do that. The elementary school, obviously, with COVID, they haven't done it in the last two years, month. but they do do that. Oh, they, yeah. Yeah. they invite the firemen. That would be honor that month. Firefighters that month. That's what we do. You know, it all ties in. It all ties in. Yeah, I mean. I know people were angry we missed the boat on, you know, we could have went to Blue Days when those officers, four officers got killed, all this stuff. Maybe we just throw out one day this year as First Responders Day and everybody wears whatever color they want. I agree this with year. you. I think and then next year we hit the, the, the ground running with the committee, but maybe we throw something like the calendar. First Responders Day, whatever day we pick, you know, pick something. And then so you can wear it. We salute the service day. Salute the service day. It could be anybody. Service. And, you know, honor everybody by wearing whatever. You know, whatever color you want, blue. Um I know it might be too soon, but um the element we were just invited uh the fourth precinct is having their open house on May fifth and sixth, which would be a nice way for the elementary students. We we wouldn't be able to send everybody, but we probably could send two grades of kids. To go and tour the police station, they, oh, have, they have an open house every that's year, great. and they that's, invite that's the elementary idea. kids. So, I don't know if that date is too soon, but we can. I can speak to the at least the elementary principals. They might, you know, this time of year is difficult for the high school because the AP exams start. They just had a Spirit Week this week, but maybe we could start with the elementary schools and um, 
tie it to that day, invite maybe fire prevention that week to come in. Um, the fire department usually visits the school. I don't think they've done that in the last two years because of COVID. Yeah. Maybe plan yeah. those activities. I know, yeah, um, I know the elementary usually goes the to visit the fire department. Yep. Also, yes, so I guess absolutely. Yes. That, so, so maybe we, it's a little bit soon, but maybe we can launch yeah. that and then, or if the kids can go visit, um, we can yep. tie it in the following week and do at least do something, maybe a little smaller this year, that's but fine. something yeah, that's to acknowledge good. it at the elementary. Yeah. Is that right? Good, that's great. Cool. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Good. 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 Do you have the, the junior firefighters in EMTU at Cape even talk? Yeah. You have you know, the high school kids that are involved. Yeah. Mr. Schloth used to come uh, and make, um, he used to kind of come and do a, an assembly and recruit uh, kids, talk yeah. about the junior firefighters. So. You know, if we can tie those things together next year, um, you know, there's certainly many activities that we already do that could just be focused during a particular week, and that could be part of celebrating and recognizing. Okay. Sounds great. Okay. Good. Great. great. I know we're backtracking after this, but we did not look at the minutes and the agenda, so if anybody has any questions on either one of those. Yeah. Good. No, I really Did you understand the uh, approval for the um, funding for Center Avenue? That was part of the federal stimulus funding. We had allocated a portion. I like to go at the money while it's still available. I just, I just. I don't know. You say all the right things. That's what I can tell you. I just don't know what you mean. That was that was C, correct? Uh, I, I'd have to look, but does it say Santa Avenue? Um, I don't, let me look. Let me look. Yes, exactly. yes, mm -hmm. that's just a partial funding. It fit, it helped reduce, it helped oh, give us some money for the additional projects we're doing. Okay, so if we don't have any questions, um, before we start, uh, before we adjourn the meeting, um, I did want to just remind you because it is a live stream that this year's budget vote and trustee election will be taking place on Tuesday, May 17th. Um, and there are two seats up this time, myself and Mr. McNally. I will not be running for the Board of Education, unfortunately, due to personal and professional commitments. I will not have the time required to perform this most important service. I do not think it would be fair to the kids or the community to run for a position I cannot promise to fulfill. Pete, um, I have served with you for the past three years, and the community is lucky to have somebody like you that cares so deeply about the kids. And thank you for everything that you've done and everybody else that I've been serving with. And um, Candidates that would like to run for the Board of Education, you must file your petition with the district clerk no later than 5 p.m. on Monday, April 18th. And the information can also be found on the district website under the Board of Ed tab. And that being said, I would like to adjourn this meeting and go into an executive session to discuss personnel matters. Can I have a motion to move into an executive session? So. So moved by Mr. McNally, second. 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 Good night to everybody at home.